my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is brought to you by longtime sponsor Kindred Bravely. From adorable maternity wear to comfortable nursing bras, this mom-owned company has you covered. See all of their comfy clothing at kindredbravely.com. And when you're checking out, use the coupon code BIRTHHOUR15 to get 15% off your first purchase. Before we get to today's birth story, I want to talk a little bit about our online childbirth course. It's called Know Your Options, and this is the course you've been looking for if you just have that gut feeling that you know you should be taking a childbirth course, but maybe the one that's being offered to you by your care provider is not exactly what you're looking for. It might be more catered towards the type of birth they want you to have versus making you informed of all your different options and how to address different things that happen in birth, because as this podcast has shown us, birth is very unpredictable. So we would love to have you check out our 12 module course. You can go to thebirthhour.com slash course to see detailed outlines of what is included in the course. You will also get a bonus course called Beyond the First Latch that is an additional six modules all about pumping, feeding your baby, going back to paid work if that's part of your plan. And we have a special coupon code for you. It's 100OFF for $100 off enrollment. Again, that's thebirthhour.com slash course. And last thing before we get to the episode, we also want to share that we have a Patreon page. This has been going for about seven years now, and it's a place where you can support the birth hour, but you get fun perks in return, like access to over 600 additional birth stories that are not in your main podcast feed. And of course, membership in our private Facebook group at the $5 a month or more level. This is the best place on the internet. You hear people talk about it a lot on the podcast. It's a great place to get support, find friendship, get questions answered, and connect over our love of birth stories. So check that out at patreon.com slash birth hour. Today's birth story guest is Anita, and she's going to be sharing her experience with pregnancy and giving birth in Norway. She was planning a hospital birth with midwives and ended up having an emergency cesarean. All right, let's hear from Anita. Hi, Anita. Welcome to the birth hour. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Hi, Bryn. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Of course. I'm excited to hear your story. But before we get to that, can you tell listeners a little bit about you and your family? Sure. So my husband and I, we live in Northern Norway with our son, Louis. He is a little bit past nine months old now. And we have one little cat and I'm not Norwegian, but I ended up here. (laughs) Okay. It's always fun to hear about the maternity system in another country, so... For sure. Yeah, let's go ahead and just hear about finding out you're pregnant, how your pregnancy went, anything you want to share there. We got married in December of 2021, I think. It was a hectic time. (laughs) And shortly after that, I actually, I started my period two days after our wedding. Not very fun. And then... When I was ready for my next cycle, I didn't get one. And I had had a birth control implant that helped kind of to regulate my cycles because I have very long, very painful periods. So I thought maybe, you know, it's just my body adjusting to not being on hormonal birth control anymore. And I had got that removed in October. So just a couple months before our wedding. So, you know, naturally my first instinct is, oh, what if I'm pregnant? And, you know, I waited until when I thought, you know, now now I've I've kind of missed it. And I had taken a test before, you know, for science, <laughs> but it was very much negative. And then I think it was the day of or the day after I had officially missed my period, I took a test and it was negative. And I, you know, then I started testing pretty much every day. And around four or five days after 
the day that my period was supposed to start, I got a very faint positive. And of course, I freaked out. I was so excited. I ended up buying another test that was of better quality just to double check. And sure enough, another faint positive. But, you know, I was hopeful. I, of course, automatically told my husband because I cannot keep that kind of secret to myself. I had no intentions of trying to come up with a cute way to tell him. And then, you know, I was just waiting like to get that stronger line and I have no impulse control. So the next day I took another test and I got a faint positive again that I thought was a bit stronger. And I thought, oh, come on, like, because my husband was not convinced. I swear men will not see a second line unless it's the same color as the control line. (laughs) Mine at least. (laughs) And then the third day I took a test and it was so starkly negative and I was so confused. And I thought, you know, maybe I drank too much water and my pee is just really filtered or, you know, I started coming up with all these excuses. And then the next morning I took another test and it was completely negative and I just felt like my heart sank to the very bottom of my stomach because I had read about chemical pregnancies. I know people who have had them and I just thought, oh no, like this is what's about to happen to me. Uh, But I thought, you know, it's still very early. Who knows? I waited a few days. I tested again. It was negative. And I just kind of accepted at that point that this is the situation I'm in. I just kind of have to wait for the bleeding to start, but it didn't. And I was getting so frustrated and so confused and it just never started. And then I think it was around 20 days after my initial positive tests. We had some friends over just trying to take my mind off of things. It was a weekend too. And I told my husband that day, I said, if my period does not start this weekend, I'm calling the doctor on Monday because then there's something wrong. And, you know, we had our good friends over and then they went home to get their kids to bed. And they said, you guys can come and hang out at our place if you want instead. And then when they left, I remembered I have not peed for like four and a half hours. (laughs) And I had one very bad quality strip test left. So I thought, I'm just going to take it. And I kid you not, I dipped that thing. And sure enough, a very faint line. And I, of course, started freaking out. My husband's like, there's nothing there. I brought it with me to our friends and I showed her and I'm like, look, tell me you see a second line. She did see a second line. And then she gave me one of her pregnancy tests that she had like stashed for safekeeping just in case. And the next morning I took it and there was a very much strong second line there. And I was just so confused and shocked because I had not bled at all in those 20 days, nothing. And I know that those initial tests were positive. They weren't strong positives, but they were. Hmm. So I just kind of went down the Google rabbit hole of what's going on. And I tried to find anyone who had experienced something similar to me. And it was still like halfway through my pregnancy. And I brought it up at every midwife appointment, at every doctor's appointment, like what happened, what what's going on? But I never really got a straight answer because I don't think they knew either. But I finally found a website that I do not recall which one because I've looked at so many. Mm-hmm. But they said that women after they get off of hormonal birth control and they've been on it for a long time, they can deal with kind of weird ovulation and release two eggs in the same cycle, but a few days apart. Yes. And my theory now is that I did ovulate twice. And if that happens and both get fertilized and one is lost early enough, the other one can absorb it and you don't experience any bleeding. And when I read that, I just felt like an inner peace, like okay, this must have been what happened. And there's no way to tell on an ultrasound because it was so early. But like, I just, I felt like, oh, finally I got some sort of closure. (laughs) But it was a really, really weird thing to deal with because on the one hand, you're really excited. But on the other hand, you can't stop thinking about that initial like, okay, well, what was that? And am I crazy? And then I'll look back on pictures of those first tests and I'm like, no, that is positive. Like there's no way that's an evaporation line or, you know, just like a fluke. Like it, it was a very strange thing to wrap my mind around, but you know, I've kind of just accepted it. And I ended up having, I think, like the longest pregnancy ever because of that. Mm. (laughs) I know everyone feels that way, but yeah. (laughs) yeah. So that was like the beginning part. And after that, I mean, the first few months, I know that most women deal with, you know, nausea and sensitivity to smell and some morning sickness, but I like routinely every day from when I woke up to around 3 p.m., I could not keep anything down. And then after 3 p.m., I could eat 
absolutely anything and I'd be fine. But anything before that time, it would just come right back up like instantly. Even if I didn't feel nauseous, like I would eat something and I'm like, oh, that stayed down. And then two minutes later, I was sprinting to the bathroom. It was not fun. <laughs> yeah. After that, I my pregnancy weirdly got continually easier. Uh, even through the third trimester, it just got easier and easier with every day, like physically, mentally, everything was just, I felt great. I had a lot of water retention, which I thought was very strange because it happened very early on. In the first month I gained like, and I'm going off of kilos, but around 12 kilos in the first month. And you could see it in my face, but it happened so quickly that I didn't even really realize it. And when I look back on pictures now, I'm like, wow, I'm five weeks pregnant in this picture. And I look like my face looks like I'm two weeks from my due date. It was crazy. <laughs> but yeah, I just quickly want to touch on the care that you receive here in Norway. Yeah. It's very midwife led mm -hmm. and every woman is... I don't want to say, well, I guess assigned a midwife at the beginning of her pregnancy. And as long as your pregnancy is going smoothly, you only meet with the midwife and everything maternal is completely covered. You do not pay anything like at all. And it's just, it's fantastic. Uh, if you, for some reason, don't really get along or just kind of feel like you'd match better with another midwife, you can request a switch and they will arrange that no problem. So yeah, everything here is very, very much midwife led, which I really, really liked. Yeah, that's awesome. I know that that's, you know, more common for sure than in America, for sure, in a lot of countries in Europe mm -hmm. and everything. And was it everyone was giving birth in the hospital with a midwife or did that vary as well? When you are at the hospital giving birth, you have midwives that come and check on you and help mm -hmm. deliver the baby unless there's complications. Right. Sometimes it's the same one, sometimes not. We live in a pretty small town that's around 40 minutes from the hospital. And we only have one midwife that comes because, I mean, it's a tiny little town. There's not pregnant women here all the time. <laughs> so mm -hmm. my midwife was only here every other week on Tuesdays. But I mean, if I ever needed anything, I could drive there and get an appointment, no problem problem. But I do think that if you live in a bigger city, you can like request to have your midwife like at your birth, but they're all just absolutely amazing. And they're so friendly and they're all very well educated and they're just, it's great. I loved it. Awesome. All right. Well, anything else from your pregnancy you want to share? Do you want to go ahead and talk about how labor started? Yeah. So around 35, 36 weeks, I started having some somewhat concerning symptoms of potential preterm labor. Mm. Uh, and I called the hospital, obviously, because, you know, I'd read over and over again, heard over and over again, you'd rather call one time too many than one time too little. So I went in, I think I was 35 plus three. I went in and they did a cervical check and everything and a non-stress test and everything looked great and felt great. And my due date was for November 6th. And after they did the cervical check, they told me, they said, your cervix is very ripe and very soft. You're not dilated yet, but we would be so surprised if we did not see you here to give birth, like before your due date, like there's no way you're making it to your due date. And I thought, fantastic. Great. Because <laughs> based like how the pregnancy started, like from my initial positive tests, I was supposed to be due uh, middle of October. And then at dating ultrasounds and stuff, I mean, that was a whole thing in itself. My first dating ultrasound, they put uh, date of conception at three days after my initial positive test. And I thought, there's no way, come on. And then I was given the due date of November 6th. And I was like, oh, are you kidding me? Because I, you know, got set back like three weeks. So I thought, great, if this baby comes a couple weeks, like obviously within reason, but I thought, nice, like, you know, a week before due, that would be fantastic because I feel like I've already had to take on three extra weeks. <laughs> so should I just get into how birth started? Yeah, let's hear about it. Well, I thought maybe I'm going to have an October baby, but suddenly it was November 1st and there was no baby in sight and I was still very much pregnant. We started nearing my due date and I thought, come on, like the midwife said, you're not supposed to be in here until past the due date. Like my cervix said, the midwife said, come on. No, he did not want to come out. 
So here after you go past your due date, I think it's when you hit 41 weeks and your due date goes after like when you're 40 plus one, that's when you're due. So at 41 weeks, I go in for a non-stress test and they do a cervical check, all that. Everything looks amazing. And I think I was a centimeter dilated maybe a bit more because they said that they had the opportunity to do a membrane sweep and they asked if I wanted that. And I said, yes, please, (laughs) anything to help this baby get out. (laughs) So they did that. And it actually did not hurt as much as I was expecting because I've heard so many women say that, that it hurt almost like more than birth itself. Mm. And that was not my experience. Maybe I just had an absolutely fantastic midwife who did mine, but I actually was totally fine. It was not as painful as I expected it to be. So after that, you know, went home, had the normal cramping, some spotting, some bleeding. And I was just like crossing my fingers. Just please, please, please come on. Uh, no luck. A couple of days later, we went back in. I think they do it. I don't remember exactly. I think it's every two or three days you go back in. I think every three. So we go back in, they do a non-stress test. They do a little ultrasound to make sure that everything looks fine. Everything looks fantastic. Everything looks normal and healthy. I was like, great. Uh, they asked if I want another membrane sweep. Yes, I did. So they did that. We went back home. I was miserable. I was so annoyed. And yeah, I started losing huge pieces of my mucus plug. I was, you know, dealing with Braxton Hicks, but no baby, nothing like that. The next couple of days, it was just the same. And I had an appointment, I think it was for the 14th. And we go in and this is like now, what, eight days after I was due or something like that. Anyways, I go in, they do another check. Everything looks great. Everything is soft, right? One and a half centimeters dilated, another membrane sweep. They recommended acupuncture, but I couldn't get an appointment, which was very frustrating. The next day, I was just so frustrated. It was the 15th now, like nine days after due, no baby. So I had gone to the store and I thought maybe I'll just make a really nice dinner for me and my husband to take my mind off of things. And I'm standing in line and this lady I know, she comes in and she sees me standing in line and she comes over and she's like, you're still pregnant? And in my mind, I was like, uh, obviously, like, why would you yeah, ask Yeah, not helpful. <laughs> like, no, I'm actually not. It's just a pillow. Like, I don't <laughs> know what, but she, she was like, oh, I'm so sorry. And gave me like a neck massage, like a spontaneous neck massage as I'm standing in line at the grocery store. It was so much appreciated. And she's like, this just sucks. Like, uh, you should not have to be pregnant for much longer. And I'm like, I agree. <laughs> she redeemed herself. <laughs> she did. And I went home and I'm not joking. I sat there and I was just like seething. I was so annoyed. And you know, I had done all the things. I was journaling and meditating and thinking Mm -hmm. like, maybe if I can relax my mind, I can, you know, will this baby out of me. Yeah. (laughs) No such luck. And I thought, well, maybe I need to do the opposite and just get real mad. (laughs) That didn't work either. But I was still just like thinking about what she said. And I thought, you know, I've had it. I have had it. And I've always like the thing I was most excited for, I think during my pregnancy, like other than the meeting, the baby part was like when labor starts, like I was, oh, is it going to start with my water breaking? Am I going to start getting kind of tractions? Like what, how is it going to start? But at this point I was like, you know, I don't even care. It does not need to start by itself. I'm over this. And this was maybe half an hour after I talked to the lady in the store, I called the hospital and I said, hi, I have an appointment for or I think it was two days later. And they said that when I came in for that appointment, that they would probably induce me. And I called them and I said, hi, I have an appointment in two days to potentially get induced, but I have had enough. Is there any possibility that I could get in earlier? And they said, absolutely. Let's check. And they said, well, it's kind of late to start today. It was 3 30 4 p.m but how about you come in tomorrow and i said tomorrow they said yeah if you come in at nine tomorrow then we'll just get you started we'll induce you and i thought perfect thank you good (laughs) and i just felt like oh finally okay like now i know now i know that like at the latest nine tomorrow something will have started like Mm -hmm. thank goodness so my husband gets home and oh right he was supposed to leave on a work trip the next day 
like quote unquote was supposed to. And I was like, there's no way you're going. He's like, well, this baby's never coming. And I thought, well, maybe you need to pretend you're going so that the baby's like, no, I'm going to ruin it. Well, he comes home and I look at him dead in the eye and I said, you're not going on that work trip. And he's like, what? I'm like, I'm getting induced tomorrow, not in two days. And he's like, okay. I said, yes. So suddenly he like kicks into nesting mode completely. Like this man had the chairs upside down on the tables and was mopping the floors and just going complete like, oh my goodness, like we need to get the house ready for bringing a baby home. And I was, oh yeah, sure. Uh, Kick my feet up and relax. And I made us a nice dinner. We had some steak and potatoes and, you know, just a really nice relaxing evening and getting all excited for the next day. We made sure the bags were packed. And Bryn, I... Listen, I have an older sister and she lives in the States and I had got stuff to send her a package and I had every intention in the world to send this package on like this day, like the day that we're in in the story. Okay. So I had everything that was in the package written down because when you ship a package overseas, you need to like write down everything that's in the package. Right. And I told my husband, I said, Hey, we need to get this package shipped tonight. And he said, well, we're, the store opens at seven tomorrow, like where you ship it from. And we have to be at the hospital for nine. So we'll just, you know, ship it on our way to the hospital. And I was like, okay, fine, whatever. Cause it was pretty, it was getting pretty late. So we got the house in order, had a nice dinner, you know, end up getting to bed kind of, you know, on the late side for considering an induction, but I was just so excited. Well, I think I fell asleep around 1130 PM and I woke up at four on the dot, like four zero zero. Like there was no minutes. It was just four hours. And I have like this weird lower back pain, which I have had before. And I just like got down into child's pose. I'm like, whatever, it's pregnancy related. And you know, that was my first mistake because I did not have back pain when I was pregnant. I was one of those lucky women who did not have any pelvic girl pain, no back pain. For some reason, my 4 a.m. brain was trying to convince me that now suddenly I have back pain. So I do a little yoga pose and hold it for a little while. And then, you know, oh, the pain's gone. So I lay down. I'm like, now I can sleep. But it comes back and my brain is still not cluing into what's happening. So I take a painkiller and my husband wakes up. He's like, what's going on? He's like, is it baby time? I'm like, no, it's fine. Go back to sleep. (laughs) I take my painkiller, do my yoga pose again, try to lay down again. And then it happens again. I'm like, wait, those felt kind of like on a pattern. So I get up and my husband (laughs) sits straight up. He's like, it's baby time. I'm like, even if it is, there's no way that we're in a rush. I promise we are not in a rush. Yeah. Just go back to sleep. You need to sleep. He did not go back to sleep. He pretended to go back to sleep. There was no way that man was sleeping. (laughs) (laughs) But I went to the bathroom. I got in the shower, turned it on nice and hot. And that did help. But I was having, they were just like on a schedule from the start. Like it was every four to six minutes and they were lasting like pretty much perfectly one minute each. At around 5.45, I end up calling labor and delivery and asked them like, what should I do? It end up starting by itself. And they're like, that is amazing. Uh, come in earlier if things get more intense. Otherwise just, you know, come in for your scheduled time, which is at nine. Well, in case you don't remember, we had that whole package scenario. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the package. <laughs> the package. So at around seven and the stores here open at seven, we're like, okay, we need to get going because like, I was just like, we have a 40 minute drive to the hospital, 40 minutes. And we have a package that we need to ship. So we get in the car, everything's packed up. We, (laughs) we get to the store where he's supposed to ship the package and I'm having, I'm still having very regular contractions. And my husband goes in with the package and I told him, I'm like, get snacks and stuff. Cause that was the plan too. I said, we should get snacks and send the package tonight. And he said, no, we'll do it in the morning on the way to the hospital. I should not have listened to him. He goes in to get, he comes back like 20 minutes later. I'm like, what took you so long? And he's like, I forgot your sister's name. And I was like, oh my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) I almost like went crazy, but I was in the middle of a contraction. There was not much I could do. And then he's like, and you have to tell me what kind of snacks. I just stood there and I was staring at them and I couldn't figure out. I'm like, you should have just grabbed anything and got back to the car. Like, oh my stars. So anyways, we get to the hospital and that car ride, it was like four minutes of absolute bliss. And then just a minute of me 
just like losing it in the passenger seat. And I had back labor, which it was an experience. <laughs> but we we got to the hospital around eight and, you know, they did, they monitored a little bit, made sure it was the real deal. It was a little bit before nine. They did a cervical check. I was three centimeters dilated, fully effaced. They said baby's in a great position, but I was showing early signs of preeclampsia. And my one wish for birth was to be able to be in like the birthing pool, the birthing bath. And they said, you can do anything during your labor except the bath. (laughs) I was so frustrated. I thought this is the one thing I've been looking forward to. And it's the one thing I can't do. Mm. But you know, it is what it is. There's no point. I mean, there's nothing we could have done about it. So usually here in Norway, they don't have you on constant monitors. But because of I had like a little bit of protein in my urine and I was very swollen and my blood pressure was kind of concerning, uh, they did have me on constant monitoring. And mind you, I was 41 plus five. I was so, yeah, it was not fun. So, you know, I got into like the little, like the waiting room, like where they're waiting until it gets to full-blown labor. What is it called? Triage? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, it kind of depends on the hospital. They might have yeah. like different ones for labor and delivery. Or- but I mean, we got like our own little room with like these weird like birthing chairs and a bed and... Okay. So you were in labor and delivery. It was just not like a room you would give birth in. Yeah. I guess you could say that. Okay. So, and that was around 10. And at this point, contractions were two to three minutes apart. It felt very intense. And I labored in there for a while and... Then they, you know, let us have our own room, like the room that I would be birthing in. Spoiler alert, I did not end up birthing in that room. (laughs) A few hours later, around two, they did a cervical check. And, you know, I didn't have any medications. My, My goal was unmedicated as long as I can. I just wanted to see like how far I could get myself. It was kind of like a challenge with myself. And I had been at three centimeters and Now I've been laboring very effectively and I kind of had wanted to do hypnobirthing, but I never actually got around to like completing the course, but I read a lot about it. So I did have like, I was in that mental place where I could mentally get myself through contractions in a very like calm and collected manner. And the midwives were actually asking me like, is this your first baby? And I, yeah, they said, you are like, you're taking this like a pro, like you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do with every single contraction. And they were just so impressed and shocked. And, you know, whenever a new one would come over and a contraction would start hitting, they'd go to start like, you know, advising me of what to do. And then they'd kind of stop because I'd already be doing that. And it was just kind of funny. And I was like, yeah, I had like seven pregnancy apps downloaded and uh, I've listened to like all the birth podcasts in the world. (laughs) (laughs) I'm prepared in like every way I can be. So, and I remember like when I was zoned, like in my zone, like I don't think I talked for like two hours. I just laid in the same position in my bed just, you know, breathing through every single contraction. I'm, I I kind of remember my husband talking with some of the midwives and they were telling him like, look at how she's handling these. Like she's dealing with this like a pro. And in my mind, I was kind of like, yeah, I am. So when they come in to do a cervical check in my mind, I'm like, give me a six, give me a seven. I got a four. I was so like, mm. really? <laughs> Really? But then I kind of told myself, you know, things can go from zero to a hundred really quick. Like you never know. Every birth is different. Every birth is special. So uh, when they checked me, they said, your bag is bulging. And I knew that, you know, bursting that bubble can help things speed up, but it can also be a lot more painful. So I told them, yeah, you can, you can break my waters, but I want the epidural first. (laughs) And 15 minutes later, Brynn, 15 minutes later, I had an epidural. And it was like, I was actually the first in that hospital, I think, to ever get that kind because the anesthesiologist had just done some new course in, I think, Switzerland to Hmm. learn about this new kind of epidural where you only feel it like where you have contractions. I could still walk. I could still go pee by myself. Like it was amazing. It was perfect. That's awesome. It was absolutely incredible. And the same time they placed that epidural, they placed an internal fetal monitor because of my high blood pressure. And I, I was, you know, still at a four. I got to eat a little bit around 3.30. And then I got to, they told me like, you should sleep. You should, you know, rest while you can. 
So, you know, I take a little nap, woke up around 4.30. They checked me. I was at a four. (laughs) And then they said, like, do you know what? Your contractions have slowed a lot since you got the epidural. So are you fine with being hooked up to some oxytocin? I said, yeah, sure. So, you know, they hooked me up to that. I stood for a while, you know, tried to move around, got up around 5.30, walked around, tried to get contractions going. Then at around 6, my son's heart rate just dropped very like suddenly it just plummeted. So they removed the oxytocin, called the gynecologist and all the doctors in. They said everything looked fine. He was fine, but I had not progressed at all. I was still at a four, but he gave the green light to restart oxytocin. So we did checked again at 7.30 PM and I was still at a four. (laughs) At this point, like I thought like I, I could not like physically I could handle it, but I was just so like mentally just done. And I looked at my husband at that point and I said, I'm just so like, I do not want to do this anymore. I just don't want to. And they had told us when our son's heart rate dropped, they said, if this happens again, based off of the situation we're in with your potential preeclampsia and all this, like we're going to have to do a C-section just so you know. And I said, that's fine. So I looked at my husband, I think it was around 740 I looked at him and I said, I just don't want to do this anymore. Like, I just don't want to. And 10, 15 minutes later, just completely out of the blue, his heart rate was, it was decelerating again. And they told me they're like back in position because the last time that it had happened, I had to get (laughs) on my knees with my face, like buried in the pillow with an oxygen mask to my face, like butt up in the air. Like I'm not wearing anything down there. Okay. It was like a very humbling experience. So I get back in position, (laughs) oxygen mask on my face, butt up in the air. And like they were calling in the OB and the doctors and the anesthesiologists. And they were telling me like, I'm so sorry, but we're going to have to go for an emergency C-section. And at that exact moment, I felt the Heplock in my hand just blow. Like it just blew. Like I felt like the most intense pain ever in my hand. And I thought, oh no crap. And I had to have the oxygen mask to my face. So I kept trying to like tell them and they're like, no, 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 mask back on. Like you need to have the mask on. And I get that they were doing it for my own good, but I had no clue. Like, how do I communicate this? And Brent, the dumbest thing that I said, I took the oxygen mask off, looked at my husband. I'm like, don't forget my phone. Cause I was under the impression <laughs> that he was going to be like in the room when our son was yeah. born. Yeah. But I got rushed down. It was like 7.55 and at 8.14, so not even 20 minutes later, our son was born, but I had to be put under anesthesia. So all those, you know, every single like longing that I had for like that first moment where you hear your babies first crying, get to see them for the first time. Like I just kind of got, I didn't get that. It was just taken from me, like instantly, like in one instant, everything went from, oh, I'm going to meet my baby to crap. I can't witness this. Like, I'm not going to be able to witness this. Mm -hmm. And I remember like right before I went under, like the one thing I could not stop thinking about was my hand. And I managed to get contact with one midwife and I looked at her and she, she was Finnish. I'm also, my dad is Finnish and I do know enough Finnish to have a decent conversation. And I said, to her and finish. So I knew that she would understand that I was talking to her because I needed to get someone's attention. I looked at her and I said, and finish my hand, my hand is hurting. And she looked at it and her face went white as a ghost and she immediately drew attention to it. And then and they said, like, the last thing I remember them saying was, okay, we need to use her other hand. And they said, okay, well, what if we can't get that in time? And he said, we have to get it in time. And then I, like, that's like the last thing I remember. And then I was put under and my son was born and I wasn't there to see it. Well, I was there, but I wasn't there. And my husband wasn't there to see it. And I have no pictures. I have no memories. Uh, I did not get to hear that first cry. So when people ask me now, like, oh, how magical was it hearing this cry for the first time? I'm like, I didn't. And then it just gets kind of awkward. But I woke up a few hours later in recovery and I got to meet him then. And he was just absolutely perfect and beautiful and three and a half kilos and 50 centimeters and just absolutely perfect. Him and my husband got to do skin to skin while they were waiting for me to wake up, which was really nice. But I ended up having to spend that night in the recovery room and my arm ended up getting infected. 
because of the blown Heplock. And all night I had a blood pressure cuff on and every hour it took my blood pressure because of my potential preeclampsia. But that was on my arm that was infected and they did not realize that. So it was like the worst pain. So I kept waking up every hour. And then I told them they came in around six in the morning and they asked, you know, have you been able to sleep? I said, yeah, but I keep waking up every hour because of the blood pressure monitor. And they said, you should not be waking up because of that. Like that should not. And I said, it is very painful. And they came to check. They said, it's not on that tight. And I said, but my arm is hurting. And every time that my blood pressure was checked, I like my other arm, I would just grab whatever was closest and just squeeze because the pain was unbearable. So because of that, both of my arms were just so sore for days. Oh my gosh. And because of the epidural and the fact that I had a C-section, like I could not get up. So I literally, I could not use my legs. My right arm was the infected one and I could not use that at all. And then my left arm was like half usable. It was just, it was brutal. Yeah. We ended up staying in the hospital for around three days. On the third day, we went home and they were great at the hospital. Like I had all of my meals were completely paid for. I could eat as much as I wanted whenever I wanted anything. Like it was free range. My husband too, like the only thing he had to pay for, I think was parking and the fee of staying overnight. And that was like $20 a night, like US. Everything else was just completely covered. That's amazing. It it was fantastic. It was like being at a hotel. (laughs) (laughs) They made sure I was able to shower independently before we left. And a lactation consultant came in every single time I wanted to breastfeed, which was really great. So they could help with latch and make sure everything was going smoothly. And my one win from the early postpartum is that I had zero issues at all with breastfeeding. Like, I am so thankful for that. I am so thankful. The only thing that I kind of struggled with was, well, I mean, genetically, the woman on my mom's side of the family, my older sister, we do generate a lot of breast milk. So sometimes my boobs were so swollen that my son could not, he literally could not latch. It was like latching onto a balloon. (laughs) So I had to use a nipple shield sometimes on the left boob because that one liked to overachieve. The right one was fine. But yeah, so that's the birth and the pregnancy. And that brings us to getting home and the postpartum period, I guess. Yeah. So how did that go? Well, where we live, it is dark all the time in the winter. The sun, You don't see the sun for a couple months every year. So getting home at like the beginning of that period and then having a very unexpected... I mean, at the back of my mind, I knew there was a possibility that I could have a C-section. You never know. Like you can't really plan a whole lot when it comes to birthing. But, you know, I, I like to plan and be prepared and, you know, have everything in order the way that, you know, I want it to be. And I mean, nothing major. It was just, I hadn't like researched at all, like about getting out of bed right after a C-section. Cause that is like the Olympics. I'm not even joking. Like it is painful. You have to learn how to use muscles. You didn't even know you had, <laughs> but our son did not sleep. He did not sleep. The only times he would sleep was when he was directly in contact with me, like laying on top of me. And, you know, you read and you hear all about safe sleep and what's okay and what's not okay. And your baby should always be sleeping on their back on a flat surface that's firm and there should be nothing else in the crib. And I thought, well, what if the only place he sleeps is on me? Like that was the only way that he would sleep. Like we tried absolutely everything and nothing worked. And being sleep deprived and recovering from a C-section and all these hormones and emotions and you're leaking from every single hole that you have on your body, basically. And then just like trying to deal with, you know, like the shame and guilt of, you know, letting your son or daughter, your, your brand new baby sleep in a quote unquote, like unsafe position. But like at the back of your mind, you're like, I know this is the only way they'll sleep. And now I kind of have to flip a coin and decide if... I want to go through the frustration of trying to force an infant to sleep in a way that they can't comfortably or, you know, let them sleep on me, but then 
you know, constantly stress over like the risk of, well, what if something happens and I'll never forgive myself. And don't get me wrong. I am 100% for safe sleep, but I just didn't like, I, I didn't really have a choice. And I immediately started researching. I thought there has to be something wrong. And that went on. I mean, I was averaging maybe two or three hours of sleep every 24 hours because oh I, gosh. I could not let myself sleep like when he was on me. Yeah. And my husband, he would obviously like he and paternity leave here, by the way, absolutely great. Maternity leave, great, just fantastic. Um, so he was home for the first couple weeks. And like any time like after he got to sleep for a while, he would come in and take our son and just let me get a few hours uninterrupted. But a lot of times like he would just cry. He would just cry. He just wanted to be with me. So I couldn't even like relax and fall asleep because I all I could hear was my newborn baby crying. And sometimes he would fall asleep with my husband, but I mean, like he just, he just would not. The only reliable way was me. And we tried everything. I mean, absolutely everything. I think I read like an insane amount of articles about, you know, how to get a fussy baby to sleep and nothing worked except letting him sleep on me. So that went on for a while. And I mean, as soon as I'd recovered enough from the C-section and he was big enough, I did actually, I had an ergo baby carrier an Omni 360 and he learned to nap in that. So I let him nap in that so I could actually like do some things during the day and feel like a a functional human being. Mm, Yeah. (laughs) It was great. I think I've got so many hours of use out of that thing. (laughs) Yeah. So finally the symptoms, like he would poop seven, eight times a day. And I know it's normal in the first few weeks, but it was he acted like he was in pain every single time and it would just be explosive and it would be foamy and it would be green and it would be mucusy. And I was just like, I know that this can be an intolerance or an allergy, but he did not have any rash. And I mean, and me being me, I was like, well, he doesn't cry that much, but well, obviously not because I literally held him all the time because I didn't want him to cry. So, you know, for, for me, I'm like, oh, he doesn't even cry that much. And my husband's like, yeah, he does. I'm like, no, he doesn't. And he's, you know, I was still freshly postpartum. So I don't really think my husband felt like telling me off and saying, well, the reason why he's not crying is because you're holding him all the time. But that was the reason. And finally, I think it was late February. Yeah. February 26th. I went dairy free because I had finally had enough and I was ready to try. And well, wouldn't you know, like, (laughs) A week later, he was already just a completely different baby. And I was Mm. shocked. I was shocked because he did not have like the textbook, like main symptoms. But when I finally started actually allowing myself to read about it, because for me, when I, I I would search up like cow milk protein, like allergy slash intolerance, and I would read constantly crying and rash. And I'm like, nope, not that because he doesn't have that. You know, but then when I finally swallowed my pride and listened to my husband and actually read all the rest of the symptoms, I like kind of had a breakdown because there it was like the answer was in front of me all along. And I just kind of felt, I felt so bad. I felt so bad. And then I told myself, you know what? You did what you could with what you knew. And at least you're doing it now. At least you're doing it now. So yeah. I went I went dairy-free. Uh, I read the labels on everything, like everything. If I saw an ingredient that looked suspicious, I was standing there in the grocery store Googling, looking absolutely crazy probably, um, and then like putting it back and being all disappointed. And I mean, people, I don't know what they thought about me. <laughs> it must have looked hilarious. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, now it's been half a year. And I mean he's doing great. He sleeps well. He naps well. He eats well. It's going absolutely fantastic. But I mean, the symptoms, it was just not what I expected. And some of them were very specific to like very niche symptoms that I, I mean, like I I felt so weird Googling some of them. I'm like, I hope no one ever looks at my search history because some of them (laughs) look very questionable. Like yeah. why baby rash just around butthole? Like, cause he had like this red rash that was just around his bum hole and I could not find information about it anywhere. And then when I was finally reading on all the symptoms of a cow milk protein intolerance or allergy, that one was there. And Bryn, I swear, like that was the one that convinced me because I could not find any information about it anywhere. I was just finding like diaper rash, diaper rash. I'm like, no, this is not a diaper rash. 
And I finally found it. And and then I, of course, I felt awful, but I was so relieved at the same time. I'm like, now there's not a doubt in my mind that this is what's going on. So right. yeah, it was just, it was an adventure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. I think that, you know, people talk about how giving up dairy is so hard and everything, but if you've been through a baby that truly has that intolerance, yeah. like you'll do anything to fix it. <laughs> Listen, being dairy free has been an absolute breeze compared to those first right. few months. Yeah. Like it has been like so easy, like mm-hmm. so easy compared to that. I'm like, what? Like, I mean, I get that it's, it's not fun. Okay. And it's obviously a lot easier to eat whatever you want, whenever you want. Right. But as soon as you kind of get into like the rhythm and you find your go-tos and you find your mm-hmm. safe foods, it really has been pretty smooth. And now we're at the point where we've been dairy free for six months now and he's above nine months. So there's like a dairy ladder that you can follow and he's ready to start that now. He actually was a couple days ago, but I just haven't got around to making the first recipe, but it's basically like a ladder for reintroducing dairy into the diet, like in a safe way where you start with like the easiest to tolerate kind of dairy, which is like milk that's baked into something for a certain amount of time at a certain temperature. And then if, you know, if he passes that, then we can move on to the next step. And I mean, like we're already at that point and I'm like, where has the time gone? Insane. But yeah, like it has just been, I mean, it took a while to find like good alternatives and living where we live, there's not there's not a cream cheese alternative. There's not like we live in a very small town where you're not going to find the really good imitation cheese or the really good imitation cream cheese. Like you're not going to find it. So I kind of have to get creative, but still like anything dairy free is better than those first few weeks again. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that experience. Yeah, my first had dairy issues, not as intense as that. But I mean, I noticed a difference once I gave up dairy. And then with my subsequent Mm -hmm. children, I just started off giving up dairy. Like that's how worth it it was to me. I was like, I don't even want to like mess with No, I don't even need to find out. I don't even need to. And that's what my (laughs) husband said too. He's like, hey, I was just kind of thinking if we ever have another kid, like... And I was like, oh, you, you're, th- you're on the same page as me that I started eating dairy-free before the baby's even born, like a yeah. couple weeks before the due date. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, I am way ahead of you. I've already like, that is like ironed into my brain. Like there's no yeah. like. And I mean, it makes sense. Like it's hard on our stomachs too for a lot of people. So yeah. But like, that's the frustrating part. Cause I have zero issues with mm. any foods. Like I <laughs> can tolerate course. anything. And then my husband has like. I think he has IBS, like anything. Like he eats too early, his stomach is messed up. He eats too late, he eats too much wheat, he eats too much dairy, he has too much sugar, he has too much carbonated, like he's everything. Like anything gets him down for the count in the bathroom. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, why do you have to get your stomach? Like right. why your digestive system? Why not mine? Oh. <laughs> but like dairy takes like four to six weeks to leave the system. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. So I've already planned, I'm like a month before my due date, like I am starting. If I ever have another kid, like that will be a thing that happens. Yeah. All right. Well, any resources you want to share? Still on the topic of dairy-free, there is a group on Facebook for breastfeeding mothers who have to eat dairy-free. It's just called Dairy-Free Diet Breastfeeding. That is what helped me, you know, really learn about what it is and you know, how to deal with it. And they, I mean, the group is fantastic. People share their experiences and recipes and tips and funny stories. And it's really been like, kind of like a boost for me. Like it's really helped me get through those days where it feels kind of, you know, life is unfair that I have to eat dairy free. (laughs) So that's definitely one that I would recommend. Okay, cool. Yeah, I could see that having some community would be really great for that, especially for like tips and yummy treats and things. Yes. <laughs> All right. And then what about where people can connect with you? You can connect with me on Instagram. And I don't think anyone's going to be able to find me just by typing it out if I just say it. Okay. <laughs> but I'm sure it'll be linked in the show notes. Yes. 
Yeah, but it is Anita Hulkonen Miller Jord. <laughs> it just sounds wrong. <laughs> um, and then on Facebook, it's just the same. It's just my name. Okay. So those are the two places that I'm most easily reached. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for having me. It was amazing. Now I'm going to chat with Rachel about Kindred Bravely, today's sponsor. And don't forget, you can use the coupon code BIRTHHOUR15 to get 15% off your first purchase at kindredbravely.com. Hi, Rachel. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Kindred Bravely. Oh, my pleasure. I've been a Kindred Bravely fan for years. Awesome. Well, will you tell people just a little bit about you before we get into that discussion? Sure. Um, So I'm Rachel. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I have two kids. My oldest is three and a half and my youngest is uh, just over one. Um, I'm a mostly stay-at-home mom, but I am also a birth and labor doula. Very cool. So since you said you've known about Kindred Bailey for years, I'm guessing you used their stuff with your first and then obviously your more recent baby as well. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of my, almost, I think all of my pieces from my first pregnancy and nursing experience, I was able to continue using because it's such high quality. It doesn't, doesn't really seem to wear out over time. Just wear in and get more comfy. Yes. I've been, I've been so surprised by how like some kind of magic, how they can have such stretchy, (laughs) comfy clothes that don't like lose their shape. They last a really long time, even though we're wearing them way more than we would wear uh, (laughs) non-nursing or maternity clothes. Yeah, I think my husband would be really happy if some of it would finally wear out. <laughs> wear if you're so long. I had that same thought when I had been wearing the Simply Sublime tank like to bed every night yes. for like two years. <laughs> I'm like, I wonder if uh, anyone else is tired of this because I'm just going to live it until I don't need it anymore. But um, how did you first hear about Kinder Bravely and what were some of the first things you tried out from them? I first heard about it on your podcast on the birth hour, like a zillion years ago, probably you did an interview, an interview with the founder. And I loved that it was a mom owned business. And, um, also that it was located in Encinitas, California, which is, um, or the founder is from there, um, which is where a nonprofit that I worked for was located. So I spent a lot of time in that community. So it sort of felt like supporting something local, even though that wasn't exactly where I lived. Very cool. All right. And then what things did you hear us talk about that made you (laughs) click over to the website and order? Uh, well, I just loved, I love the idea of buying from a smaller company. There's really not that much out there in terms of maternity and nursing wear. And there's very little that can transition from being maternity and into then being nurse, nursing wear without mm-hmm. like looking really huge or baggy or having these like, you know, super empire waists and things like that. Right. Um, but this seemed to check all those boxes and their customer service was just amazing. The first thing that I tried was just some of their underwear. And I loved that it had the like the low cross on the bottom and somehow magically it never seemed to wedgie. It just never seemed to like ride up, which oh, I don't know, for me at least when I'm pregnant, I feel like I was picking my wedgie like 500 times a day just because of the way your body changes and everything. But this underwear just stayed put perfectly all the time. Um, so from there, I started um, adding to my collection. I got their hospital gown, which I wore for both of my um, hospital stays with my kids. And then the original um, Simply Sublime or the two-for-one nursing bra, the one that can be both a nursing and a pumping bra, mm-hmm. their original version of that way back in the day. And then I've gotten a couple more of those since. Very cool. Yeah. The underwear, I didn't really get to experience the joy of maternity underwear until my third baby because I just kind of wore like really low cut underwear and just made do. But once I was introduced to Kendra Bravely, I sprung for those and it was just like a world of difference. (laughs) I couldn't believe I hadn't done it before. And they're really affordable as well. Like you can get a three pack for not very much. Um, So I'm glad to hear that they were anti-wedgie for you as well. (laughs) I still wear them as my sleep underwear all the time because again, I just, they're magical. I don't know how they stay in place, but they do. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. They have so many more now too. Um, from when I was first looking at their underwear, like they even have thongs and, um, different materials and stuff like that, but everything they make is just so crazy soft, but yeah, like I said, just doesn't lose its shape or, um, quality. It's pretty amazing. Mm, Totally. And it's interesting. A lot of the, the tanks, especially, I feel like they're not full on compression wear, but I feel like they have an almost compression like quality to them. So I just felt more like tucked in and supported postpartum, especially in their tanks. And I love that they don't have, that they have the built-in bra, but not 
just like that weird shelf thing. Yeah. And I, I'm a small chested person normally, but when I'm pregnant and nursing, I become larger chested and somehow it always seemed to fit. Yeah. I agree with that too. I'm always, you know, singing the praises of the busty sizing and the, the non shelf bra. I love the way that their, um, their cups are molded. And and I, I think some of them come with the like foam pads, but I always pull those out. Um, but yeah, just so supportive, but I, I always forget to talk about what you were mentioning with the compression of the belly. I always felt it was almost like it was like, a flattering look postpartum for me to see like everything was very seamless and yet still really comfortable. So I liked that too. Completely. And then my first go around, they didn't have any of their like lounge wear yet. Mm -hmm. And now that part has just exploded. Um, so I wear their joggers all the time. Those are the ones that my husband would like to like burn because I wear them so often. Um, and then they're, um, the like bamboo shorts. Um, and both of those, I just love so much cause they're super comfortable, but they also have pockets, which yes. is just necessary when you have kids. And then the last piece of, um, clothing that I held onto in my postpartum experience for as long as possible before packing it away were the leggings. Yes. Um, and my husband was finally like, are those still pregnancy leggings? And I was like, yes, <laughs> what do you want from me? <laughs> um, but I packed them away to save them in case we have a third so that they're ready to go. Yeah. And they, I don't know if uh, you found it the same way, but they worked for me for maternity and postpartum. And again, somehow like stretched over my huge belly, but then were like compression for postpartum and didn't get stretched out during pregnancy. It's just crazy. Totally, totally. And the softest pair of leggings I think I've ever owned. Yeah. And I was actually wearing the joggers today. <laughs> so those those last forever. There's nothing really like particularly postpartum or, or pregnancy about them other than they're just really comfortable. And yeah, the pockets are very important as a mom. And I love that even there, um, I think you probably have the the sh- you mentioned the short set, but they have a dress uh, sleep shirt as well. And even that has pockets, which you don't find very often. So I love that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, those were some things that I hadn't tried all of. So it was fun to hear about them. And I really appreciate you just sharing your experience and your love of Kindred Bravely that we both share. My pleasure. Uh, I a Kindred Bravely gift card has become my go-to gift for friends of mine when they're pregnant and postpartum. It's just easy. Anybody can find something they like and something they fit there. So it's just a really awesome gift to be able to share. That's so smart. And it's not something that people probably know about unless they have somebody who tells them or listen to this podcast. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much again. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much again to Anita for sharing her story with us and to Kindred Bravely for sponsoring this episode. Remember to use the coupon code BIRTHHOUR15 for 15% off your first purchase at kindredbravely.com. And if you want more information from today's episode, head over to thebirthhour.com and just type Anita's name into the search bar to find her show notes page. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.